Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the, this week's uh, webinar from Annika and the team. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Suk this morning from um, Annika. He's our head of um, SEO. Um, what I'm going to do is while we're just waiting for a few more people to uh, join us, is I'm going to start with a poll. Um, so you should be able to see on the right hand side of your screens uh, a couple of different tabs. So if I just explain how that works, and then as you join, you can um, sort of take advantage of it. So first of all, there's the chat, which lots of you have found already. So thank you very much for everybody for um, saying hello. It's good to see so many people joining us. Um, you've also got the Q&A, um, which is the second tab along. So if you've got a specific question, please um, write the question in there, and then I will try and answer it. Um, so it's got a lot of slides to get through um, this morning. So um, we may have to either answer in between or at the end, and we'll just need to judge it as, as we go through. And then also I've got some polls for you. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start with the first poll. Um, if I can get my cursor to work, it just seems to have suddenly decided it's not going to work. So I'm going to start the first poll. And the first poll, um, I'm going to read it out so that um, everybody can hear on the recording. And what I'd like you to do is to choose one response. Um, and the poll says, how would you rate your current level of experience and knowledge of search engine, engine optimization? In other words, SEO. Do you consider yourself to be a newbie? Uh, in other words, you just started to learn about SEO theory and different tactics. Do you consider yourself to be a beginner? Um, you understand the basics, but perhaps you've not applied it yet. Um, you're an improver. Um, you're doing some aspects of SEO, but want to learn more. And then experience, SEO is a big part of my role. Well, actually, it's quite an uh, quite a interesting mix of people. About half yeah, of yeah. you, 40% are improvers, which means you, you understand some of it and you want to learn more. So obviously you're in the right place today. Um, we've got three people that are experienced. Well, hopefully there'll be a few golden nuggets for you. Um, so hopefully there'll be some few uh, bits of um, stuff in here that you can take away that maybe you've not picked up before. And then at the other end, we've got about 20% uh, of the people are newbies. So what um, will happen is as Sook goes through, he will try and explain all the terminology for you. Um, and make sure that yeah, um, yeah. Uh, that you know we cover everything. So um, I think we've got uh, a good thirty odd people joined us now. So I'm going to just do a quick couple of slides and then pass over to Sook. Um, it's just a bit of an introduction to the people that might not know us. Um, but um, first of all, um, let me get going on here. Okay, so uh, this is what we're going to cover today. So I'm going to just do a little bit of a, um, a a couple of slides about Annika, just two or three. And then Sook's going to cover the basics of SEO, just to bring everybody up to date, and the core Google algorithm update that happened um, in the last two weeks, a week ago, I think it was. Um, yeah. Some admin tasks that you can do during the uh, lockdown. Uh, and then um, some ways of fixing low performing keywords. Um, and uh, this includes things like low click through rates and poor rankings. Uh, a little bit on feature snippets or position zero, those those big ones at the top. Um, and then if we've got time, because um, we do realize quite a few people have got other things planned for 10, um, we'll do some quick keyword research and some page load speeds for the more technical. So if you can hang around past 10 o'clock, and we have to run over. If we think that we need to split this into two, which is what happened with Ed last week, then we will, you know, we'll we'll stop, and then we'll run a second uh, webinar to carry the extra stuff forward. So just um, a quick couple of things on Annika then. So um, for this is actually our thirteenth year, um, which I, f I found in Annika back in two thousand and seven. Uh, there's twenty of us in the office. Well, not in the office, um, but normally in the office. <laughs> Um, we're both a Facebook and a Google partner. Um, we run Lestal Digital Live, which is the um, monthly meetup, which, of course, this has replaced, and the conference, uh, which is due to take part in October. 
Uh, whether we'll be able to have a conference in October or not, or whether we'll do a virtual conference, we haven't decided yet. Uh, last year, we were the winners of the DRUM uh, UK Search Awards, which has actually three different awards. And then if you're not already aware, we run an academy and we've got um, uh, we've got free access to our training courses if you want to get any of that at the moment as well. And then uh, finally, uh, on Annika, this is just an idea of some of the clients that we work with. OK, so I think it's time. Um, that's just some of services. So I think it's time to pass over to Sook. So I'm going to mute my mic now and Sook's going to take over. Um, we did if I think I need to interrupt you. Um, I'll turn my mic back on so you yeah. should be able to see that. So thanks, Sook. Looking forward to this one. Thanks, Anne. Hi, guys. Thanks for joining us this morning and happy Friday. Um, as Anne said, yeah, I did add quite a lot of slides to this deck because um, we did have an algorithm update on the 4th and I wanted to do more tips on uh, during this period how to deal with COVID-19 with regards to content and SEO in general. And I'm, I'm notoriously bad at adding loads and loads of slides anyway, so I'll go a bit quick on the ones that I can do and spend a bit of time on the ones that need a bit of uh, explanation. Um, Cool. So I just want to do uh, take a step back and just talk about SEO in general quickly. Uh, so the key aspects of a SEO project can break down into these three elements. Uh, so you've got technical SEO, on-page SEO and off-page. So quickly, um, technical SEO is something we do right at the start of our campaigns in which we uh, audit a website and um, uh, have a look at how effectively the pages within that website can get discovered discovered and indexed in Google. So if you're producing loads of uh, great content on the site quite regularly, um, that content might not be displayed. Uh, it might not be found in the first place or displayed in the way that you want it to. So that's usually the first port of call. Uh, we also look at things like page load speed and mobile versus desktop usability, because these two things are key ranking factors. Um, the next one that we tend to look at the area is on-page SEO. So this area has um, is the easiest for a non-developer to affect in terms of it's purely based on website content. So it's stuff that you control, uh, especially if you have access to your content management system like WordPress or HubSpot, where you can log in quickly and then basically post your blogs and edit your landing pages to add in keywords, um, change the way that your uh, tags appear in the search results, which we'll go into later, that will affect your click-through rate in the Google rankings. So this is where I focused on the most, uh, assuming that um, it's not easy to access developer resource at this time, uh, and generally it's just easier to impact. Um, and then you've got off-page SEO, which is mostly to do with building your reputation externally through mentions, uh, which we refer to as citations and links pointing back to your site. So this is a key aspect of ongoing SEO for us uh, with some initial auditing we do in campaigns where we look at what kind of links are pointing to you initially uh, and, and, and how can we kind of resolve any spammy links and uh, build more of the relevant links and partnerships. Um, and then we do we incorporate that in our ongoing SEO with on page and off page working hand in hand to uh, make that happen. So I just want to jump into a algorithm update that occurred on the 4th of this month. Um, so without going into the background of algorithm updates in general, um, this algorithm update is called a broad core update. So what that is, is basically in theory, it encompasses every aspect of your online visibility. So it's looking at how well your backlinks are in terms of are they spammy or relevant? Um, do you have content on your landing pages? Is it relevant to the topic someone searched for? Um, is it duplicating content from a competitor website? Uh, how fast is your page load, uh, et cetera? So that's the theory of this update. In reality, the last four updates that have occurred, uh, three to four updates in the last two years, have been focused mostly on website content and the quality of that content. In particular, um, are you an authority on the topic you are you are selling or talking about, basically? So particularly medical sites, there was a medical specific update two years ago that looked at that. Um, so um, the information is just coming in on the impact and, and what the causes are of people dropping rankings. So we have seen some rankings drop for big brands in the last two weeks. And uh, just quickly, a way that you can check whether you've been impacted, if you're not familiar with this already, is there's a quick browser tool called uh, Penguin. 
you can use that link to go on it. And what that will do is it will uh, ask you to connect to your Google Analytics account and then it will map all of the algorithm updates up to today versus your um, organic traffic. So you can quickly see if you had an update at this date, did your traffic go up or down? And then from that point, you can diagnose your rankings and tech SEO and all the content issues. Um, some of the questions Google recommends you ask yourselves if you think you got hit was, I'll just read a few of these out. Um, does the content provide original information, reporting, research, or analysis? Is the content uh, substantial, complete, or comprehensive description of the topic? Um, does the content provide insightful analysis, interesting information, etc.? So these are kind of uh, um, obvious points. So you can basically ask yourself as a user, is this content um, meeting the search intent? When I land on the page, am I expanding enough on this topic to warrant a some kind of action, like a conversion or sharing the topic or whatever it is that you're looking for users to do? So it's really no-brainer kind of tips than that. And now I've got a link there for a complete list of questions you can ask yourselves. And this is just an example of uh, using that tool, Penguin, to check an algorithm update. Um, and this is a website we inherited where we did see a bit of a drop and we need to kind of diagnose what previous work has been done and how can we resolve issues like content and backlinks. Um, on the flip side, this is a client of ours that we had inherited last year who had been hit uh, two updates ago and uh, started to recover uh, from this update. So we had basically diagnosed that there were issues with content. So the content wasn't in depth enough. It was an e-commerce site. Uh, we weren't um, publishing enough uh, relevant blog posts and leveraging that, leveraging that, those for backlinks. So we did a lot of work in the last 12 months. And it seems like this is starting to pay off with, this is an example of visibility score, which is a collective ranking score of a group of keywords and tracking. So, uh, so far, so good on that. So yeah, it's not necessarily you're gonna see a negative, you could see a positive from this. Realize I should speed up a bit now. Um, so, the next bunch of slides I added as an extra was um, quick wins with regards to um, messaging uh, during this period. So I had a look at uh, a free platform, if you're not familiar, called Google My Business. So Google My Business is basically a free platform that you can uh, sign up for. And uh, it essentially allows you to control uh, your business details and uh, respond to reviews online. And it's mostly a local SEO tool. You can post on Google My Business. So where you see your search results, if you search for your brand and you've got the knowledge graph area on the right, you can control a large portion of that using Google My Business, uploading posts and images. You're controlling your business details, your social signals, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm just going to touch on a few points within this platform that you can use to uh, update your messaging during this period. So if you're uh, operations have uh, changed in that your um, your time, your days and your hours have changed. Uh, you can quickly log into this uh, after you sign up and change the days and the hours that you're working. And you can even select certain days that your office will be closed. Um, so this, uh, in, uh, this uh, shows up almost instantly when you change this in the search results. Um, and another feature you can use is uh, the temporarily closed feature. So a lot of, uh, for example, McDonald's, although this might change next week, apparently, um, have used this feature uh, to mark all of their businesses as temporarily closed. Again, it happens, uh, it shows up in the search results almost instantly. And a cool feature that uh, Google have released for this period is the COVID-19 update. So. Google My Business allows you to post messages uh, uh, using their platform. So these messages can be a general post where you put, put in a banner and a bit of text and a call to action button that go, takes you to a phone number or a uh, landing page uh, through to uh, highlighting special offers. Um, so this particular post allows you to put in a specific COVID-19 related message uh, with a call to action. So if you want to um, reassure users that you're still operating as normal uh, or um, something has changed and you've got an FAQ page you want to link to, you can put a brief message on here and then link to that page or put in a phone number in there if you've got a specific phone number you want to direct people to. So and, and this the good thing about this is that it pins above all of your other posts. So it's more prominent when you use it. So this is a really good feature you can uh, consider using. Um, another one that I've picked out, out of the many posts options is the special offers one. So we've made use, use of this with uh, promoting our webinars now and our free uh, training resource. So 
that can be found, uh, a bit of a plug there, academy.anica.co.uk. And it's just our way of basically adjusting our strategy and basically communicating that through this as well as emails and, and webinars. So you can consider that if you're shifting your focus to other services. And another cool feature, which not a lot of people are making use of, is the messaging. So if you're uh, it's similar to a chat bot, basically, uh, but your basically messaging is not a bot. Um, so if you don't have access to a chat facility on your website, uh, you can make use of this and sign up to it. And what it basically does is install a desktop or mobile app. And then it basically allows you to communicate with people in a messenger style. So this might be particularly useful if you have less capacity to do comms and uh, you just need to basically queue these conversations up and chat people rather than um, taking phone calls every two seconds. So it might be something useful that you might want to look into. Cool. So another area I looked at uh, quickly is uh, website content. So a lot of people are, even if there aren't any changes in operations, uh, people are posting messages just to reassure their uh, existing or potential new customers uh, that they're operating at, operating at full capacity. Uh, so this is an example of one of our clients where they've published a blog post and they've linked to that post from their banner on the homepage. So it's a really quick thing that they did right on day one and um, it gets a lot of uh, interaction, uh, which then funnels through to other service pages through call to actions on that page. Um, so it's a really quick thing we suggest you do if you haven't done already, although things are moving quite quickly. So we might not be in this position for that long, hopefully. Um, if you can't edit the banners or add banners on your website <clears throat> and you're in WordPress, for example, uh, similar with HubSpot and, and Squarespace, you've got plugins that allow you to add in banners and then add in your link to your uh, the blog post you want to link people to. So you can install that. This is a really basic example, but there are some that look a bit better than this. Um, and it's really quick to do. This one works as well because I've tried it out. Um, and then FAQs and blogs. So we've been working with our clients from day one to basically figure out what questions people are asking. Uh, and uh, aside from the usual uh, no brainer questions and uh, basically how can we reassure people we're still operating, uh, answer all type of questions. Uh, we have a logistics client as well that this is a bit more important for. Um, so we basically, with our clients, come up with FAQs and general information and publish them in a series of blog posts. Um, where possible, uh, uh, I also recommend looking at which search queries people are using to find you in the last uh, 90 days because um, this could give you an indication of uh, what kind of things people are searching for now versus um, you know before this period. Uh, so in this example, I've got um, questions about digital marketing strategies during COVID-19. Um, this might be a bit of a um, chicken and egg thing because we've been publishing content around this topic as well. But generally speaking, Google Search Console, which is what that screen cap is for, is a good resource to find these queries as well as a site search facility if you have that and you're tracking that in Google Analytics. So I recommend having a think about that and backing up with data where possible, what kind of topics people are looking for and publishing a series of blog posts. And if you've got an existing content marketing strategy, you would have obviously changed that strategy now to suit you know, this period. Cool, so I'm just gonna jump into uh, the next topic, which is basically fixing low performing keywords and uh, just check the time. Okay, that's doing all right. So. With this whole presentation, I wanted to focus on quick wins and uh, mostly around on-page SEO, because as I said earlier, this is where you can have the most impact um, without the need of a developer. So with that in mind, uh, one of my first tasks that I do in an SEO campaign is to look at the current keyword traffic and how well it is uh, driving the traffic to the website and how well these keywords are converting in the SERPs. So I split this topic into fixing keywords that cause a, a low click through rate or CTR in the Google SERPs, search engine result pages, and then generally fixing keywords that rank low. So uh, and I'm talking about keywords that rank below page one or beyond page one. So just quickly, uh, we're looking at click through rate. 
So a click-through rate is defined as the number of clicks your search result received divided by the total number of impressions, i.e. the total number of times people saw that result. So the reason why this is important as a metric and one of the first things I look at uh, is because let's say you have a bunch of keywords that are already ranking on page one that have a decent search volume, i.e. there's a decent amount of people searching for those keywords. Because they're already on page one, you've already done 90% of the work in getting them to page one because it's really difficult to do that for uh, popular keywords. So the next step to take it over the line is to basically make sure you make it the most of that real estate on page one by enticing people to click through to the site, giving them a reason. So that's where the click through rate metric comes in because it can indicate how well those results are optimized. Um, so I'll just go into, uh, yeah. And uh, you can find this metric in various tools. Uh, this is a free tool called Google Search Console. Again, if you're not familiar, um, and you can find a list of keywords and landing pages that have high or low click through rates. And you can also find metrics like uh, average position and your impressions and clicks in general. So this is really good and uh, it's a free tool. Uh, this tool also includes a lot of technical SEO features, which I won't go into, but uh, this is a main one of the main things that I use this for at the start of a campaign. So when thinking about click-through rate and the SERPs, I just wanna go into this in a bit more detail then. So the SERP stands for Search Engine Result Pages. And uh, when you look at this example, you can see um, well, hopefully, or you can do a, a Google search of your own. I recommend doing one of those searches actually and just seeing which type of result you would click on above the others. So I've done one for hotels in Leicester and immediately I can see um, the kind of result I will click on. So that is the, the one that mentions the, the price per night. So that's more of an editorial consideration that I've made um, based on price. Uh, but there are other examples where these SERPs aren't performing too well. So the title and meta tag with the orange box. So, and I'll go into what those are if you're not familiar. Um, that affects the, the headline there, that's clickable link, and then the text below that. So as you can see at the top example, um, they've not made the best use of the space because uh, the, the characters are being cut off. So there might be other important info that a website wanted you to see, but you can't. So you can't make a decision to click through or not. Um, you can also add SERP features uh, indicated in that green box, which are basically questions and answers or FAQs. And you can highlight any FAQs that you are answering on your site uh, with a bit of code called schema, um, not to jump ahead, but I'll go into that later. So there are a few ways that you can basically affect the SERPs to encourage more click-throughs. And we'll just go into that in a bit more detail now. So when I was talking about things that you are in control of on page, um, this is divided into, so this is a typical landing page that you'll have access to if you log into WordPress. Um, and what you've got is the top part of this page are the elements that will mostly impact click-through rate and the bottom element, which is paid body, page body content, headings, images, rich media, et cetera. Those are mostly gonna impact rankings. So starting from the top, you've got the title tag, which is basically your headline with the clickable link. So in this example, we've got a title tag that has our keyword in there, digital marketing agency. It has our brand in there and it has the region that we're based in. So this is a pretty quick and simple way that we've optimized this to uh, appear for this specific keyword. Um, and uh, below that, you've got the URL, which I won't go into too much because you typically don't want to edit your landing page URLs. You only come to edit those when you're doing blog posts. So that might be a separate thing to look at. The next thing to look at, the main thing is meta description. So that's the long bit of text below the title tag. So this is more of your uh, opportunity to include uh, keywords, USPs, uh, call to actions, like we saw in the other example with the prices or the hotels. Um, you can add uh, specific things like click to view special offer and things like that. So this is where most of the work is done really in encouraging people to click through. Um, so those three elements are for the most part help impact click through rate. So if we look at the bottom now, um, the things that impact rankings for the most part are the page body content. So within the body content, and this is a lot of the work that we do in the first couple of months of getting a client is assess how well the, the body content and the pages in general are optimizing keywords that a client wants to rank for. 
So if you think about that topic, um, digital marketing agency, Leicester, in the body content, we would have optimized the heading tags, starting with the H1 tag, which is the most important in terms of SEO. Uh, we would then look at uh, adding variations of those keywords in H2 and H3 tags, which are less important in the hierarchy. And then within that process, we also look at the body content itself. So that's the big blocks of text that we're looking to really expand on that topic. So when I mentioned the algorithm update, um, in most cases that I saw, topics weren't expanded on enough or there was simply like thin content on landing pages. So this is a real big area to optimize on landing pages. And within that, it's important to break up the content with um, images and rich media and subheadings as to not have a wall of text and call to actions throughout. Um, so yeah, this is how a, 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 an optimized page can affect click-through rate and rankings. So in thinking about this, so the previous example was looking at desktop SERPs, um, but Google is mobile first in its consideration on whether or whether to, uh, whether not to rank your website. So if your website is mobile friendly, and everything appears on screen and everything is clickable and loads quite quickly, then um, it will rank that. Uh, it will take the, the ranking position of the mobile page and apply that to the desktop result as well. So if you're, let's say your, your website isn't mobile friendly. Oh God, sorry, I should have muted that. Um, if your site isn't mobile friendly, then both the mobile and desktop versions are not going to rank well. So in thinking about that way of thinking from Google, um, we need to look at how well the, the title tag and meta descriptions appear on mobile devices as well, because there are slightly different character counts for those, which I'll go into later. Um, so I've got some examples here of how desktop and mobile results appear and the ones that I think are pretty decent. Um, so the first example is obviously a hotels one. So it's got a good editorial um, element to it with the pricing and USPs in there. The character counts are stuck too, so there's no dot, dot, dot at the end of these. Um, that's hiding content. And the mobile version of this result on the right is pretty useful as well, I think, because um, although the description at the bottom does get cut off, most of the main info is before that cutoff point. So I think that's really good. And then the second one is a uh, Nike Air Force One result. So both the desktop and mobile results look complete. Um, there's a thumbnail image there, and it's something that I'll probably click on. So now that we've talked about how important click-through rate and rankings are, I just want to get down to impacting that, basically, and uh, starting with gathering data. So you can find out if you know your keywords and landing pages are performing well for click-through rate and rankings or not. So there's several ways you can go about gathering data uh, for this. Um, if you have access to a premium uh, uh, rank tracker tool like SEO Monitor, which is what we use, um, I recommend using that because it's basically pulling in Search Console and Google Analytics data in one place. So you can clearly see the, uh, the keywords used versus the pages people land on. And then you've got click through rate, your average ranking positions and search volumes, which is pretty important. Um, so in this example, I've added search volumes, which is an average amount of time a month people search for a keyword, which you can't see because I've blocked out. Um, I've added that metric because I want to uh, determine the value of those keywords. So remember, I was talking about looking at keywords that rank on page one already and the ones that have a decent amount of people searching for them to prioritize my workload. The, this is the main metric I use to judge that search volume, average position, and then obviously click through rate. So I've used SEO Monitor to gather this data, but if you don't have access to a premium tool like that, you can use Search Console still. You'll just have to manually gather search volume data from AdWords, Keyword Planner, and other free tools available online. Um, so I've gathered this data on my keywords, my landing pages, and those three metrics above. And what I want to do now is filter that data by high search volume, low click-through rate, and then I want to have a separate tab for that data with high rankings and that data again with low rankings. Reason being because I'm trying to solve two problems. I want to improve click through rates and I want to fix low ranking. So I want to basically look for all those different criteria and just have a list, a massive list uh, of pages that I can kind of do a two in one solution with. So assuming that I've gathered all this data now. What I want to do before I do anything is make sure 
the keywords people are using to find you are returning the, re the most relevant page. So we do this in our, in our setup process uh, with a page plan. So this is basically an Excel sheet where we map the topics that, pe that the clients want to perform for, and then we map the keywords, providing we've uh, researched and validated them, you know, they've got high search volume, low competition, et cetera. Uh, and then we map the page that they're appearing for currently, which may or may not be the right page, and then map the desired page. So in this example, which is, happens quite often, uh, we can see a keyword, women's night trainers, that's appearing for a blog post, which in most cases tends to be, um, due to content marketing um, department doing a good job, is basically in-depth content pieces mentioning the, key, the main service keyword or product keyword loads of times, so much so that it ranks above the service page, which is fine. But in most cases, when you reach that page, there isn't a clear opportunity or call to action to then go to a sale or some kind of conversion point. So nine times out of 10, it's better to have the main service page rank for the top level keyword as opposed to a supporting content page. So in this example, I've mapped the design page I want to rank for. And the same with the example below or similar. I've got a different service page ranking where I want the main service page, Nike Air Force Ones, to rank for those two keywords. So again, the best thing to do before doing anything is taking your data that you gathered and basically mapping the keywords and pages that they appear for currently like this and just making sure that the right page is ranking because this will help you when you uh, look to improve rankings because we'll look at improving the content to basically have one page appear above the other. So before I go into um, the suggestions for um, improving content, I just want to take a step back and look at the process uh, uh, that Google uses to find pages on your website, assess the content, apply an algorithm, and display your pages in the search results, and just how those three areas of SEO I looked at at the start apply to this process uh, that work. So we start with, uh, and we're thinking about Google, uh, it's the same process with Bing, uh, the search engines for the most part. So the first process is basically Google will uh, use a program called Googlebot uh, or a spider and basically um, discover the pages on your site. So the way it's doing that is it's, fo it's following hyperlinks. So if your site isn't hyperlinking between the pages and there isn't an intuitive um, uh, way to navigate through the site or a sitemap, uh, then it's gonna uh, fail to find all those pages. So you could be producing some awesome content but there's poor internal linking to allow Google to discover that content. So that's one stumbling block, which we pick up in the tech SEO um, uh, audit at the start. Another issue could be the page is loading slowly or it's not uh, showing up on mobile devices as well as desktop. So there's a lot of stumbling blocks that could stop your site from being indexed in the first place. So Google crawls your site, providing everything's okay, then it uh, makes a decision on um, how good the quality of your content is. So I was talking about on-page content and algorithm updates in general and the quality of content. Is it duplicating? Do you have any content at all on your pages? Um, do you have a, a blog or news section that is updated regularly with new posts? So Google looks for those updates once it's crawled a site to figure out, have they actually done anything new on the site? If not, I'm not going to I'm not going to index, um, which is the, the final step in this, um, the most latest version of this page. The next stage is uh, the algorithm. So once it's crawled and indexed your site, it's then looking to apply an algorithm and decide whether to display your site for a user's search query. So if someone is searching for Nike trainers, for example, and my page has been indexed, but the content isn't as in-depth as my competitor, um, or I've duplicated my competitor's uh, content, then it will decide on uh, not uh, showing my result and returning it to the search results. So there's a lot of work that gets done during this uh, this process of applying the index, uh, applying the alg algorithm, sorry. So the work that obviously goes uh, behind that is what we did for one of our clients uh, when you saw the increase in uh, rankings was um, improve the content uh, um, add more optimization, make it more intuitive, add more rich media, et cetera. Uh, and then the final step is basically um, the Google SERPs. So it's showing up in the Google now. You've done all of that work leading up to there. 
but the title tag and meta descriptions are written uh, poorly, or there's there's no titles and metas at all, in which case Google will look at what the user searched for in Google and try and pick out text on your site relating to that and populate the title and meta space itself, which is terrible because it makes bad decisions and it doesn't look well most of the time. So this is where you've got a lot of control over and it's a no, it's a no brainer to basically fix this with um, SERP optimization. So thinking about title and meta tags to start with and um, its impact for the most part on click through rate, as well as rankings, because what I forgot to mention was title tags um, are a ranking factor. Um, so Google will look for keyword mentions in title tags, uh, whereas meta descriptions aren't a ranking factor, they're just for usability. So I forgot to mention that. Um, so thinking about title and meta tags, so if you go back to your data sheet where you've gathered all this data of keywords and landing pages that are performing poorly for this area, uh, to speed up the process of sifting through this data, you can use a free tool called uh, Screaming Frog. So what this will allow you to do is basically crawl those pages like Google would, and it'll pull out your title tags and meta descriptions and your heading tags and all and anything that's got content in there, and it'll uh, allow you to export that as an Excel sheet. So at that point, if you're looking to fix your title and metas, and you've got quite a lot on your list, you can use that tool and then work through the export uh, Excel and, and work in that and add new columns for the new title and meta tags that you want to fix. So it's super easy to use. Uh, there is a limit of 500 pages on the free version. Um, so I just consider that if you're going to use it. And that's an example of me you, uh, crawling a list of URLs I found. So assuming you've got a list of pages you want to fix then, um, this is what I sort of recommend doing in order to fix them. So looking at title and meta tags, and this sounds pretty obvious, uh, you want to write engaging text to include keywords. So thinking about rankings, if you want a page to rank for a specific keyword, include keywords in the title tags and meta descriptions, um, include call to actions, uh, unique selling points and brand mentions where possible. So if you think there's a lot of stuff you want to mention in your title and meta tags, for example, and there's not enough space, uh, prioritize keywords, selling points, call to actions, and uh, and skip brand mentions, for example. So you can make a decision at the time. Um, ensure you don't exceed the character limits. So I'll go into that in a sec. And include structured data to encourage SERP features. So. When I showed the first example of uh, the hotel that was answering a question, the Q&A thing, uh, that was achieved through uh, structured data, which I'll show an example of later on. <clears throat> so talking about character limits that Google allows uh, uh, for you to display a certain uh, number of characters in the search results, uh, this is different for mobile and desktop. So I'll just start with mobile. So the title tag will allow you to display up to uh, 78 characters and the meta description up to 120 characters. Um, the desktop allows you, uh, with the title tag, allows you to display up to 59 characters. And apparently, if you write below 50 characters, um, Google will, for the most part, ignore your meta description because it thinks you're not providing enough useful content and it will find its own content. So we recommend for mobile meta descriptions, write between 140 and 156 characters just to make sure it shows up. So there's two sets of character limits for title and meta tags, which can get a bit confusing. Um, at this point, um, I usually go for a middle ground to ensure that the most important information is appearing on both sets of search results. So what I tend to do is optimize title tags to up to 59 characters, and that's it. I don't want to go over um, up to 78 characters, which is what mobile shows, because I want it to appear on desktop and mobile. Um, taking a step back from that, generally speaking, mobile devices outweigh desktop in traffic to websites, but this differs across um, industries and types of websites, B2C, e-commerce, etc. cetera. Uh, so it's always, if you're really thinking about it, it always starts with the audience and basically looking at Google Analytics and figuring out uh, where people are engaging the most, uh, mobile users versus desktop. So it's not a simple answer, but I'm just going to give you a broad answer now. Um, and then for meta descriptions, I look at writing up to 156 characters, 
with the most important info within 120. So thinking about mobile users only seeing up to 120 characters, by adding the most important info within 120, I can ensure all the call to actions and USBs and stuff are in there. And then after that, it doesn't matter if they can't see that text. Um, the same with the title tag. Uh, keep the most important info within 55 characters because if it gets cut off, um, if you see that dot, 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 you can still see all the most important info before 55 characters. So when I'm doing this optimization work, um, I basically, for the most part, we use WordPress uh, websites. This is an example from the Annika site where I've edited a page, uh, the title and meta tag. So I've used a plugin called All In One SEO. And what it tells me is the character count when I'm typing in. So it's really quick to use. Um, and this is an example of me editing that. There's similar ones in HubSpot and other uh, CMS platforms as well. Um, and I've also used a tool. So um, this is a tool called uh, Mang uh, mangoes.com. Yeah, I don't know. There's about five different tools that I tend to switch through uh, online. And basically, this tool allows you to preview how your title and meta tag looks in uh, mobile and desktop search. And when you're editing it, it gives you the character counts and stuff. So it's super easy to use. Or you can use Excel, like I was saying earlier, using Screaming Frog exports. So there's different ways you can do it depending on how many pages you're editing. So we talked about mostly SERP optimization, uh, click-through rate optimization through title and metas. Um, body content is where a bit more work is needed um, if you don't have a lot of optimized content or a lot of word count to play with. So in this example, I had to edit our international SEO landing page because it had dropped in rankings. And I'm still in the process of doing that. Um, the keywords I'm targeting for that page are international SEO agency, international SEO services, international SEO, and other kind of variations and synonyms. So the way I went about this was basically I started with the, and what I haven't shown here is title and meta description. So remember title tag has a, uh, is a ranking factor. And then I looked at the H1 tag. It's really simple process. So I added the keyword within that, um, all the while making sure that everything's user friendly. So it all reads well and doesn't read kind of robotic like early SEO back in the days. Um, and then I looked at keyword mentions in the body content and then subheading mentions. So I've got that um, variation uh, keyword uh, that, I've added, uh, that I've added in the H2 tag. And to keep that hierarchy of top level keyword, subheadings, content, variations, keywords, etc. So that's pretty much how I've optimized the landing page. Um, I can't give you a kind of a keyword optimization like ratio. Uh, because technically you're not supposed to have a formula of how many keywords you optimize uh, within body content. Um, it depends on the the topic, the industry, whether you even need a shed load of content or not, you know, like e-commerce websites, for example, uh, you don't need a, a huge amount of content on the specific product pages. So it differs, uh, but my general rule of thumb with a B2B uh, kind of page like this is to mention a keyword a uh, top level keyword two to three times within 250 words. Um, so that's a kind of a rough rule of thumb that I use and our team uses, but we do deal case by case. So it just basically depends how naturally you can add in keywords. Um, but these are the elements that I would recommend optimizing to improve rankings. Uh, and this is usually the first thing you do before looking at building links. Um, and doing ongoing PR, you need people, you need something to link to basically. And that's an example of me editing that in our content management system in WordPress. Cool, so we looked at optimizing um, landing pages for title meta tags and, and body content. So obviously you wanna monitor how well the site is performing before and after those changes. So this is an example, again, from Search Console, where I have basically looked at the uh, average click-through rate and average position of all of our keywords. Um, and I'm looking for a certain point that I've done a lot of work in and then how well I've performed after that. So I recommend doing something like this as a minimum where you keep tabs on this in Search Console or if you have access to Google Analytics and uh, keyword tracking tools, 
um, they will allow you to add notes where you've, uh, where for example, you've made site changes, uploaded content, or there's been an algorithm update. So we use notes quite religiously. So I've made a note on that landing page that I edited. I made a note in Google Analytics and in SEO Monitor to say landing page changed. And then from that point, I can easily see a month, two months down the line, whether my rankings and my traffic improved, even if my conversions or the engagement of that page improved as well. So I recommend tracking those changes after you make them. Cool. It's caught two now. Um, so the next quick win I was going to look at was, let's go back on that, featured snippets or position zero. So what I mean by this is, and you've obviously seen this in the search results, is there's three main types of featured snippets. Um, the first one we're looking at is a paragraph where you've got a straight up question and answer situation there with the question keyword highlighted in the text. Um, then you've got a kind of a list answer where you've add, asked a question that needs a bit more expanding on and um, people will tend to write step-by-step -step guides to answer this. So that one takes up, that second one is really good because it takes up a lot of real estate there and it encourages a user to click through to see the rest of those answers. And the third one there is a table uh, response, which tends to be mostly for kind of comparison of services or listing certain um, different answers in a structured way. So, go to the next one. So these results are really good because if I just go back to that, um, a lot of keyword tracking tools these days uh, include analysis on how many pixels you appear for in the search results, as opposed to where your ranking position is, because the structure of page one has changed so much, where you've got a lot of paid results, at, paid ads at the top, and then you have to scroll a bit to see the organic ads. So tools are starting to uh, look at how much space do you take up in general, paid and organic, you know, how much real estate have you got on that page? Um, and thinking about uh, position zero results, this takes up a lot of space and it appears right at the top. So uh, if you're already ranking on page one for a series of query related keywords, like questions and stuff, then it's uh, like, um, like uh, optimizing for click-through rate, it's a no-brainer to optimize to appear for rich snippets. So uh, here's an example of a rich snippet appearing and the landing page that appears for it, just to show you where this content's coming from. So you've got step one in that answer, and that re basically relates to a H2 tag, heading tag, and a bit of text below that, followed by the other steps that are subheadings as well. So this is a really simple page. Uh, that you can make up today uh, to answer certain questions. You could probably start with FAQs on your services during COVID-19 if you haven't done it already. Um, and it should display as that if it's ranking on page one in that structured data format. Um, again, because I have a keyword tracking tool, um, it's easier for me to gather data on the pages and keywords that I want to optimize to appear for position zero using a SEO monitor. And uh, like other rank tracking tools like SEM, Rush and Moz, uh, they will show you your ranking positions and the type of result that is appearing in the SERP. Is it a video one? Does it have structured data? Is it a paid result and organic, etc.? So in this example, I'm showing for a few keywords that I'm ranking on um, page one for. I'm already appearing for a feature snippet. So from this data, I can filter this by pages that are on page one, but are not appearing for a feature snippet. And those would be my uh, keywords and pages to look at on my optimization list. If you don't have access to um, uh, that tool or a premium tool like that, you can basically go back to the previous data that you had and sort the keywords and the pages by position. So sort your data by everything that's ranking on page one below position 10. And if you've got search volumes, I'd, I'd add that as a metric as well to prioritize which pages you want to work through and then manually search through each one to see if it triggers a feature snippet or if a competitor shows up instead of you, because the main criteria for appearing for this is to be um, on page one. 
So if you're on page one and a competitor's on page one, but they appear for a feature snippet above you, you can go on their landing page and figure out what did they do to appear for that and basically replicate that or do, do a better job. So in terms of the work that goes behind this, this is kind of how it breaks down to appear for a feature snippet. So a lot of this is general SEO optimization principle as well. So you've got your title tags and meta descriptions. And if and so basically you need to look at the keyword that you want to trigger the feature snippet and how well it's optimized in those areas. Uh, and then you want to look at heading tags. So you want to look at the H1 tag and put the put the prominent question in there. And if there are any related keywords to that question, you can add them in subheadings or steps. If you've got step one, steps two, step three, add those in the subheadings. And within those headings, then you want to add the, the basic the, the answers to those questions and make it as brief as possible. So you don't have to write loads of content as opposed to a generally um, optimized page for SEO in general. Um, because Google's looking and users are looking for short, snappy answers as short as possible. Um, try and break them up with uh, bullet points or number lists. So technically, these are called number lists are called ordered lists when you're looking at HTML code or unordered lists, which are bullet points. So Google likes to see these this kind of structure to help it display the answer like we showed in that example of the. Just did it OK, Google by accident. Um, yeah, so use lists where possible. God. All right. That's the problem I should have thought of. When you mentioned Google in a talk, then your phone's just gonna go nuts. Um, add rich media, so relevant images and videos where possible. Videos are prioritized over um, competition that doesn't have videos, um, particularly uh, embedded YouTube videos uh, in uh, rich snippet results. Uh, so that's really good to do. And also I mentioned an example I'll show in a bit of uh, structured data use. Um, these are the specific types of structured data you can use to uh, stand a better chance to appear for position zero. So I would use the author tag on a post uh, um, with your details or whoever published it. Uh, the publisher tag, so your brand or business. Um, there's a bit of code called how to, which allows you to appear for those broken down kind of bullets or number list results. So those are really good. And also FAQ page schema which is basically a simple question and answer format uh, result. Um, and uh, you can apply this schema through plugins if you've got uh, a content management system or a uh, user developer. And um, the preferred, the easiest format uh, to add structured data with is uh, JSON-LD because it's basically code that appears before all of your content in the back end. And you can list all the elements on the page that you that is important data or content and structure that in the code. So we probably need a separate talk to talk about tech SEO stuff relating to that, but um, that's the overview of how you can use that feature. And uh, I've just got an example of a type of schema called FAQ page uh, that is working. So in that first example, I've got uh, a question, can't actually see it now on the screen. So 10 best hotels in Leicester, uh, 2020. Um, so under that result title and meta tag, you've got those questions that when you click on, it shows the answer. So that directly relates to this schema or structured data that has been added to that landing page. So I've been able to check whether this code exists or not by using a uh, Google structured data testing tool. And I've got a link to that below. So if you notice these results on like those hotel examples I showed earlier on, you can basically click go into that page, grab the URL and run it through this tool just to see if they what kind of schema they're using. And that'll give you a quick indication. And if you've got access to a developer during this period, hey, I want to do, I want that code on that page. Um, let's do the same thing. So that's uh, all the uh, position zero uh, stuff. So if we've still got time, I'll quickly run through keyword research. So again, keyword research in itself is uh, probably a separate kind of discussion. Uh, uh, kind of the principles of it and how you go about it and stuff. But what I wanted to do was just show you some tools uh, or um, I think mostly I've got tools in this deck. So when you go through tools that can help speed up the process of finding keywords that you can then validate later on and go through. So the most common plugin that I use for Chrome is uh, this, this one called Keywords Everywhere. 
So out of all the tools that we've got, even the premium tools that we pay for, I tend to use this the most because it allows me to search for a top level keyword and it grabs the data that is already there by Google, but it puts it in the, that right side of the where the, usually the knowledge graph is, that right side area. And you can basically download all the supporting keywords relating to that top level search as CSVs. So it's basically grabbing related keywords and people also search for keywords that Google will show you if you scroll down. So it's super easy, convenient plugin. And I tend to use this quite a lot. Um, and I basically, because it exports to Excel, I can build out my research uh, Excel sheet with all the different tabs and just narrow down the keywords I'm interested in. Um, the other free tool that I'm going back to is Google Search Console. So again, this data, this search query data of what keywords are using to find people to find you um, is really helpful. Um, and you can go as far back as uh, uh, two years um, and basically gather all the data and, and even divide it by uh, these metrics here. So what's got a high click through rate, what's got a low one, and basically how well am I optimizing those keywords on my landing pages at the moment? So this is something I use quite a lot as well. Um, in uh, the initial work we do on clients. Um, another popular free tool is Uber Suggest. So again, this is similar to that plugin I showed you earlier where you would put in a top level keyword and Uber Suggest will basically pull keyword ideas. So it's using some uh, kind of algorithm I haven't really gone into, but it's finding related keywords. It's similar to Google Ads Keyword Planner suggestions as well. Uh, I haven't, I don't think I've added a slide for that, but that's another equivalent you could use if you've got Google Ads. Um, but this is free and it's quick to use and it lets you export a CSV. And then competitors. Uh, so competitors are a great source of um, inspiration for keywords. So what I tend to do with competitor analysis uh, regarding keywords is manually search for um, the industry terms and look at the competitors that show up. And at first, at first, I look at the search results and see where the keywords are appearing in the title and meta descriptions to get an indication of whether they've optimized that keyword or not. I'll then go on the actual landing pages and look at the heading tags, look at the title and meta descriptions, look at the body content. And in this example, which is pretty useful, they've got all these subcategories for dog jumpers. So basically, you've got all those different subcategories, which could be keywords in themselves as well. So you, there you've got inspiration for a top level keyword and then <clears throat> the variation keywords that could be built out into a keyword research group for that topic. So you can speed up the process of grabbing keywords using this plugin that I put a link to. So this will basically tell you um, the uh the how people have written what words people have written in the title tag meta description and all the heading tags as you scroll down it tells you all the keyword mentions which is really handy and going back to a premium keyword tracking tool uh, if you've got access to a tool like this um this is an example of seo monitors uh competitor analysis section where it allows you to track a list of competitors, I think up to about 15 or 20. And it basically tracks um, where they're appearing for the keywords you are tracking, but it also lists keywords that you are not tracking, that they are, uh, that they're optimizing for. So you can basically track a bunch of competitors and click on any one of them, and it will show you the keywords that you're currently not tracking, along with the um, search volumes and cost per click, etc. Um, current rankings of where you're ranking versus them as well. So this is really useful. This is something I use and it's a really quick and easy uh, process to use this. Uh, you can tick all of the keywords or tick individual ones and add them to a tracking research group or export them as a CSV. And another paid tool that I use, which is quite popular is uh, Ahrefs. So Ahrefs, I think, is known mostly for its backlink audit um, ability. Uh, but it, what it also does quite well is pull the uh, organic keywords uh, that are associated with a URL. So what you can do is basically, and I'll take a step back. Yeah, it's doing it there. So I've pasted in a URL. <clears throat> and then with that URL, the tool is going through the Google SERPs and it's basically finding all the keywords related to that. 
and uh, uh, the search volumes and ranking positions for that URL. So you can export this for keyword ideation. And then another tool within Ahrefs is uh, Keyword Explorer. So this is similar to the other tools I looked at in that you type in a top level keyword. And the difference with this is you can choose to get results from Google, uh, YouTube, Amazon, Bing, Yahoo, Yandex, and a list of other search engines and platforms. This is really useful because YouTube, for example, is also a very strong search engine with loads of user data of what keywords people are searched for, et cetera. So um, I wouldn't just restrict yourself on looking at uh, Google or Bing search results. Um, so that's an exportable tool as well. So when we do our uh, keyword research seminars, um, one of the key tasks that we touch on is how to validate keywords as well. So just briefly, um, the tool that you can use, again, if you don't have a premium keyword tracking tool, uh, you can use uh, Google Ads Keyword Planner. And what this will do in terms of validation is show you a range of search volumes for a list of keywords, and it will give you a broad kind of high, medium, low competition score. So this is a quick and easy way to validate keywords aside from having a look at the relevancy of it yourself and searching in Google and seeing what kind of results are returned for those keywords. Uh, so this is one way you can do it. Or in most keyword tracking tools, you've got a research section or an ability to basically paste keywords that you're not tracking and it will pull through where you're currently ranking, um, what the search volume is and what the difficulty score is. This is really good as well. Um, so. I believe SEO Monitor is is still one of the cheapest keyword tracking tools out at the moment, um, which is why we still use it. Um, so this is what we use for the most part. It's super easy and convenient. And if I like a keyword, I can do most of my validation in this screen. So I can take the ones I want to put into a research group to look at later on. So the validation is a key part of all of this stuff. So you've got loads of tools and methods to find keywords, but the main thing to do, and it relates to the start of this presentation, is validation. Uh, because if you're optimizing for click-through rate and rankings, you want to make sure the, the, the most relevant keyword is, is ranking for the right page. And if you've not mapped the right keyword to start with through this validation process, click-through rates might be affected. So people might see the, 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 a blog post appearing for a service level keyword and not click on it just because of that, or they'll click through and then not engage by bouncing off uh, or trying to find the correct page through your navigation or site search. So this, pay, this process is really crucial before you do optimization. All right, it's uh, 10 o'clock and Anne has disappeared. So let me just see, oh yeah. I've just got one more thing to go through as well then while Anne figure out some um, internet issues. I if she's messaged me or not. Uh, cool. So the next quick fix I wanted to look at within technical SEO is page speed. So you know how I mentioned um, out of technical on-page and off-page, the most control you've got without a developer is on-page SEO. So within technical SEO, I've picked page speed because it's a ranking factor. Uh, as a problem to solve and one of the solutions um, uh, is to look at images because uh, nine times out of ten in my experience is having massive image file sizes that basically take ages to load and having enough of them particularly on an e-commerce uh, landing page um, can slow down the page load speed and that's something you can control in a content management system so taking a step back from that um, the way you can check your page speed uh, status is to use a tool like this page speed insights by google so it gives you a score out of 100 and it's a really quick way to show you how well how fast the pages are loading on desktop and mobile uh, so thinking about mobile like i said earlier and how google is mobile first i would um prioritize the mobile score over desktop in this situation and this tool also it allows you to check by page by page and it also gives you a list of uh, recommendations to fix this speed uh, this speed issue so what I haven't shown you here is when you scroll down, it gives you a list of issues like fix your images, resave in different file formats, um, look at the, the level of code, or CSS code on your on your landing page, um, loads of different solutions that are mostly uh, in the realm of developer work. Um, 
There's also a free tool within Google Chrome uh, called the Chrome Audit Tool. So the way you can get to this is you right click, click on inspect element and then click on audit. So this will basically audit the usability aspects of the page as well as the specific page speed aspects. And again, it's using a similar format as you scroll down of these are the recommended solutions. So if you're not sure you know, um, how to go about this at the start and you have access to a developer, you can use one or two of these tools and basically list the suggestions and then go refer to a developer and say, how much of this can you do versus me? Um, and another really helpful tool, which is a report within Google Analytics, and this is something I prefer to use, is uh, the page timings report. So the page timing report, basically, you can uh, select a date range of, uh, I want to look at data for the last 30 days of how users have been loading the pages, and then it'll give you an average score. So this is more of a reliable metric than the other tools because it's given you the score averaged over time. So this is really useful and you can export this as a CSV and um, basically go through the list of pages and again, go through with your developer or use the solution I'm gonna look at next and go through the images on these pages yourself. So um, one of the quick fix solutions to resolve uh, a slow loading uh, page is to look at the image file sizes. So nine times out of 10, when I do a tech SEO audit, it's usually the images that clog up the speed. So what you can do is use one of those tools and then it will list um, specific images it has found as loading really slowly because of massive file size. And it'll even give you potential image savings of like, if you'll say over there, 267 kilobytes down to 220 if you resave it. So a quick fix for this is to basically resave your images in Photoshop or similar platform as a, as a web version of a JPEG. And that will basically nine times out of 10 help resolve most of this issue. Um, if you're using uh, WordPress, for example, you can use a plugin. Uh, in this case, I've pasted a link to one called Smush It, which is fairly popular. And what this will do is basically automatically go through the images on the site and resave them. Um, plugins like this, you have to play with a little bit because you have to get the, um, the balance of re retaining image quality and low file size. So that, that needs a bit more playing with. Um, another popular recommendation is from Google is to resave your images using a new uh, file format. Um, so a couple of formats suggested are WebP and JPEG XR. I'm not familiar with the latter, but WebP seems to be a very good new file format because somehow it manages to keep the quality although you can't see in that example, which isn't very helpful. It keeps the quality, but reduces the file size. Um, so that's a really good suggestion. That is um, That option is in uh, the latest Adobe platforms and plugins as well in WordPress. Um, and another option, which is, I guess, mostly for image heavy websites, e-commerce sites, et cetera, is to save different versions of images for different users. So desktop, tablet, uh, mobile. So this seems to be kind of a last resort um, if you've got specific formats for each device uh, and you want and the quality needs to be crisp. Um, people tend to have different versions for different devices. So that's another option you can look at. So that's uh, that's pretty much it on all of the SEO points. I did go over a little bit. Uh, so apologies for all that, but there's quite a lot that I could kind of touch on with this. Um, and I think Anne was going to do another poll to look at what future topics that you could do. Uh, I can't see almost plugins for each platform. Most have a premium. Okay, okay so Anne's asking questions there, right? Okay. Uh, let me just see if Anne has posted an update or something. Ah, she's done a poll now. Yeah, so if you can take a look at that poll, we want to kind of 
list some uh, future topics and expand on those. And these are suge the suggestions that we can look into. Um, I can expand a lot more on some of the SEO stuff like keyword research and tech SEO stuff as well. So if you want to have a think about that. Okay, so email, CRM, marketing automation, a lot of results for social media. It looks like I'm back, so can oh, you hey. hear me? Yeah. <laughs> I had quite a lot of technical problems with my laptop, and uh, I've, I've dialed in and it didn't work. So I'll just uh, read out the choices because it won't show up in the video. Um, so we've got... Uh, what subjects uh, would you be interested in us talking about in the coming webinars? So more on SEO, content marketing, PR and outreach. Uh, anything on social media, including advice on organic posting, specific platforms, anything new. Um, email, CRM, marketing automation, things that link the sales and the marketing process. Uh, technical stuff, so analytics, tech SEO, site performance, CRO, etc. Uh, what's new? Um, E-commerce marketing techniques, shopping ads, affiliate marketing, marketplaces, that sort of stuff. Um, integrated strategies for certain types of industries or lead generation sites. That's sort of bringing a bit of everything in to solve a specific problem. And then marketing support, you know, things like strategy planning, managing your teams, tools, etc. So it's pretty even mixed, to be honest. Yeah. Um, just finally, uh, before we go, uh, the last is the next. Uh, presentation for next week um so um what we've got next week is ed finishing off the data studio stuff uh this was because he overran last time well done for doing the timing uh, so you did a good job of that um and then um so please please sign up for that um you can also access all of this stuff including the recordings on the webinars uh, page on the annika site uh, we will be sending the recording out in the next couple of hours uh, and then there's a couple of offers. Um, I'll just put up one for now. Most of you have seen all of the others. Um, but what we have got is um, if any of you are interested in an hour's worth of consultation uh, for any of the team, that happens to have Chris's photograph there, but all of the heads of department and myself are offering these free consultation. And also because we know some of you are planning new campaigns, we are offering a £500 discount or an extra day, depending on um, what the project is. Um, if you want to do a new campaign anytime between June and, and September. So this isn't restarting old work, because obviously there's quite a lot of people here. I've got um, projects that are you know, just in sort of limbo at the moment, or some of you have actually got active projects, but this is for any new projects um, from new clients or existing clients. Um, I think that's pretty much everything. Did you want to add anything else? There doesn't seem to be any more questions. Um, no, I was just going through those, yeah. I guess um, if there are any follow-ups, uh, let me know. I just posted my email address, and um, I was going to look at expanding on one of these areas in a separate talk as well at some point. So I guess we can look at that and the poll answers. Uh, but, yeah, nothing else from me. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. I hope you have a... A lovely weekend um, and uh, we should get you the recording. It takes a couple of hours, so we'll get to that to you pretty quickly. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks. Awesome. So Thanks, guys. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.